I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevning and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Last week, we left you halfway through Chapter 2, Ubiquitous Woodsmen, in the novel by Ivan T. Sanderson, Abominable Snowmen, the story of subhumans on five continents from the early Ice Age until today. The opening gambit was a sworn statement made by a highly respected lumberman, who had also been most successful as a timber cruiser and prospector named Mike King. This gentleman had had to penetrate an isolated area in the north of Vancouver Island in 1901 alone, because his Amerindian employees refused to even enter it on any account, but mostly because they had said that it was a territory of the wild men of the woods. From other accounts, Mr. King, it seems, that he was not a man to be diverted from essential business routine by such stories, but that he had a profound respect for the local natives because they had guided him to a reasonable fortune on more than one occasion simply by their real knowledge of the country and the timber that grew in it. Some days after penetrating this wild area, Mr. King topped a ridge and spotted below a creature squatting down by a creek washing some kind of roots and arranging them in two neat piles beside him, or her, on the bank. This should be compared with the specific remarks made by Mr. Ostman, Chapter 3, on the same subject. In my interview with Mr. Ostman, he stressed the collection of roots by the creatures and even named the plant most chosen also the careful washing and stacking of these. Perhaps he got the notion from reading this account, but personally I doubt it. King's natural instinct was to raise his rifle and sight, for the creature was large, covered in reddish-brown fur, and thus potentially dangerous. By the time the fact that brown bears don't wash roots and stack them up had penetrated, He realized that he had some kind of humanoid in his sights, and he lowered the rifle. The creature took off, running like a man, and, as Mr. King later reported, his arms were peculiarly long and used freely in climbing and brush-running, i.e. scrambling on all fours through scrub. King descended the slope and inspected the spoor left by the departed one, and noted that it was distinctly human foot, but with phenomenally long and spreading toes. On reading the original account from an old clipping to a company of Easterners some years ago, I heard somebody murmur, and so endeth the first lesson, and so indeed, for although that statement has been repeatedly recounted, and Mike King has been repeatedly said to have elaborated, no further direct quotes appear to be extant. This is the way that unexpected things happen. I know from the few that I have experienced. You are not prepared for them. By the time you have managed to bring your senses to bear upon them, they are up and away, and you are left gaping, with a blurred impression all around, a single vivid centerpiece. What more can you add unless you want to be a tattler? Mike King apparently had both the decency and the common sense to say what he had to say, and then shut up. The next lot, to have a similar encounter in 1904, were out hunting near Great Central Lake on Vancouver Island. Their names were J. Kincaid, T. Hutchins, A. Crump, and W. Buss, four citizens of Qualicum. They were apparently beating the bush, 
and put up what they afterward described as a boy ABSM that was covered with brown hair but had long head hair and a beard. This is a very odd report in that it otherwise crops up only once or twice in all the accounts of ABSMs and is categorically contrary to all the other reports by everybody who has alleged that he or she has seen these creatures at close range. The third classic report is dated 1907 and was made by the captain and crew of the coastal steamer Capilano on their return from a routine cruise during which they had called at a small landing named Bishop's Cove. There, they said, the entire Amerindian population had come charging aboard begging for asylum or outright immigration due to a huge, monkey-like, human-shaped creature that had been clam-digging along their beach for a number of nights in succession and which gave vent to most disturbing high-pitched howls. These people readily identified the creature, but insisted that it had moved into their territory with its family, if not its whole clan, and that it would not brook any interference by a few poorly armed humans. The comments on this report are rather illuminating as they display a curious acknowledgement of the presence of such wild men and the fact that while they are accepted as being basically peaceable, and known to mind their own business, and while they avoid organized men in masses, they tend to adopt a nasty tone when it comes to hunting and collecting rights, and appear then to regard the Amerinds as interlopers and a nuisance. In 1907, however, the attitude of even the British toward real primitives was going through a peculiar phase. Halfway between the concept of the worthless native and that of the noble savage. The Amerinds had proved an unreliable labor force, while certain other non Europeans had turned out to be far too civilized for rank exploitation. The idea of really primitive creatures had not yet been abandoned, and everybody was still undecided just how to behave toward them. The thought that we might be dealing with sub-hominids did not, of course, occur to anybody professing any education. After all, Darwin was hardly cold as of then. But it remained in no way illogical to the uneducated, and it was played on by the press. Now, this may in some measure account for the solemnity with which a discovery made in 1912 was greeted. I got this report from Mr. Burns, mentioned above. It came to him from the principal, a Mr. Ernest A. Edwards, who states that he was residing in Sheshwap, B.C., at the date, and that he and his wife had unearthed on the small island of Neskane, a little way off the coast, a human skeleton that they found protruding from the bank of a river. The location was noted for its abundance of arrowheads of Amerindian origin. The skeleton is stated to have measured from skull to ankle seven feet six inches, so with feet and scalp the person must have been eight feet tall. Mr. Burns received this information in a letter from Mr. Edwards in 1941, and this included the further comments that I, together with my wife, examined the jaw the teeth were of huge size, but in perfect condition, no cavities noticeable. The jawbone was so large it would span my face easily at the cheekbones. Together with the help of Indians, I crated it and shipped it to Wrexham Museum, R-E-X-H-A-M, North Wales, England, where I believe it still is. In his acknowledgment, the curator of the museum was greatly astonished, remarking, among other observations, that it was hard to believe such jaws and teeth existed in human beings. The receipt of such intelligence, as this naturally prompts an almost fiendish, Ho, ho! What is this? on the part of any reporter. So I wrote to the curator of the museum specified, and got the following reply from the librarian of the town of Wrexham, W-R-E-X-H-A-M, and not Wrexham, R-E-X-H-A-M, where there 
was no such town in Wales or anywhere else in Great Britain. With regard to your query, I have checked the minutes of this establishment, i.e. the museum and public library, for the years 1912, 1913, and 1914, and there is no mention of the receipt of a skeleton. Yours sincerely, Clifford Harris, FLA. Reports of the discovery of skeletons of giant humans or humanoids are extremely numerous and have been coming in from all over this continent for many years. They constitute a subject of their own, which I have endeavored to pursue for a long time now, but I regret to have to say without any success. One and all have just evaporated like this, but I must admit, very often within the portals of some museum which had acknowledged receipt of the relic, there is the famous story of the forty mummified giants in Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, of the giants in giant coffins in some unnamed cave in Utah, of others dug up in a peat bog in West Virginia and allegedly shipped to the Smithsonian, and of others preserved in sundry small county museums in Nevada. I have voluminous correspondence on file on these items, but I have never yet managed to obtain sight of any single bone. This is odd because human giants are not really terribly rare. I have seen it stated that there are several thousand men over seven feet tall living today in the United States, whereas such persons in the past would probably have been regarded with some awe and might be expected to have been accorded rather special burial, so augmenting our chances of unearthing them. The matter of skeletal remains of ABSMs is, of course, of first importance and second only to the procurement of a whole living specimen. The chance of unearthing a skeleton of one is not quite so unlikely as one might suppose, for it now transpires that very primitive peoples indeed seem to have performed deliberate interments, if not only to clear away refuse from the cannibalistic meal in a cave. Some ABSMs might well be, or have once been, at such a level of cultural development, and it is constantly reported by the Amerins in this area that their peculiar local variety indulged something akin to hibernation or at least winter inactivity equivalent to that of the local bears, and that they do this in caves. This presents a dubious aspect of these traditions, however, because in the absence of limestone strata in the area, caves are rarities. Nonetheless, there are caves in volcanic rocks of certain kinds, and some have been alleged to have been found in the mountains around Harrison Lake. There is one story of such that pertains to ABSMs. This, again, I got from Mr. J. W. Burns. It goes as follows and comes from the Amerin named Charlie Victor, a resident of Chilliwack on the Lower Fraser. The first time I came to know about these people, the local ABSMs known as Sasquatches, I did not see anybody. Three young men and myself were picking salmon berries on a rocky mountain slope five or six miles from the old town of Yale. In our search for berries, we suddenly stumbled upon a large opening in the side of the mountain. This discovery greatly surprised all of us, for we knew every foot of the mountain and never knew nor heard there was a cave in the vicinity. Outside the mouth of the cave, there was an enormous boulder. We peered into the cavity but couldn't see anything. We gathered some pitchwood, lighted it, and began to explore. But before we got very far from the entrance of the cave, we came upon a sort of stone house or enclosure. It was a crude affair. We couldn't make a thorough examination, for our pitchwood kept going out. We left, intending to return in a couple of days to go on exploring, Old Indians, to whom we told the story of our discovery, warned us not to venture near the cave again, as it was surely occupied by a Sasquatch. That was the first time I heard about the hairy men that inhabit the mountains. We, however, disregarded the advice of the old men and sneaked off to explore the cave. 
but to our great disappointment found the boulder rolled back into the mouth and fitting it so nicely that you might suppose it had been made for that purpose. This story seems to me to have a certain ring of truth about it, and the idea of using a boulder as a door, either for protective purposes or for concealment of a breeding chamber, is not in any way illogical or impossible. There is, however, it should be pointed out, a modern tendency to, as it were, chase anything elusive back into caves, and especially wild men. Probably because of all that has been written, from archaeological texts to comic books about cavemen. The majority of primitive hominids did not live in caves, simply because the number of caves available was, except in a few special areas, very limited. Further, they may have first entered them to get away from either heat or rain as much as from cold. Yet the remains of early men and animals are better and more readily preserved in cave floors than out in the open, while locating open-air camp sites is very chancy. The idea that men went through a cave-living phase all over the world has therefore gained wide acceptance. Sasquatches could just as well hole up in ice caves made by themselves in deep snow, as some bears do, but caves should be searched most diligently for remains or other evidence of their occupation. It was not too far away from this alleged cave site that the next encounter of which we have record, and that is documented, sworn to, and witnessed by more than one person, took place in 1915. A statutory declaration of this was sworn to in September of 1957 by one of the participants, Mr. Charles Flood, of Westminster, British Columbia. This goes as follows. I, Charles Flood of New Westminster, formerly of Hope, declare the following story to be true. I am 75 years of age and spent most of my life prospecting in the local mountains to the south of Hope, toward the American boundary and in the Chilliwack Lake area. In 1915, Donald McRae, and Green Hicks of Agassiz, British Columbia, and myself, explored an area over an unknown divide, and on the way back to Hope, near the Holy Cross Mountains, Green Hicks, a half-breed Indian, told McRae and me a story. He claimed he had seen alligators at what he called Alligator Lake, and wild humans at what he called Cougar Lake. Out of curiosity, we went with him, he had been there a week previous looking for a fur trap line. Sure enough, we saw his alligators, but they were black, twice the size of lizards in a small mud lake. A while further up was Cougar Lake. Several years before, a fire swept over many square miles of the mountains, which resulted in large areas of mountain huckleberry growth. Green Hicks suddenly stopped us and drew our attention to a large, light brown creature about eight feet high, standing on its hind legs, standing upright, pulling the berry bushes with one hand or paw toward him, and putting the berries in his mouth with the other hand or paw. I stood still, wondering, and McRae and Green Hicks were arguing. Hicks said, It is a wild man, and McRae said, It is a bear. As far as I am concerned, the strange creature looked more like a human being. We seen several black and brown bear on the trip, but that thing looked altogether different. Huge brown bear are known to be in Alaska, but have never been seen in southern British Columbia. This document brings up two questions that I should discuss briefly forthwith. The first is the matter of the law. As I have already said, we in this country do not have much respect for this aspect of human organization, and often tend to the observation that laws are only made to be broken. This is not so in some other countries, however, and the Canadians have an intense respect for their laws and for authority in general. Canadians will scoff at the suggestion that one of their countrymen is more likely not to lie before a justice of the peace than an American, but it is nonetheless a fact that a Canadian 
is more likely to make such a deposition of his veracity and has been called in question and or he wants to assert his sincerity. Also, he will think longer and more carefully about his statement if made before established authority because, should anything he say therein be mendacious or thereby cause any distress or harm to others, he will be held fully accountable. Thus, these sworn statements and others that follow have a rather strong implication. The other matter is the introduction of an almost classic red herring. As I explain at greater length in chapter 19, an inexplicably high percentage of all esoteric investigations turn up other unexpected and apparently unrelated matters that are often just as weird, if not more so, than the original object of pursuit. In this case, the matter of alligators is quite extraordinary and quite beyond my comprehension. Alligators, per se, are only two in number, one species being indigenous to the Mississippi Valley and around the Gulf Coast of Florida, the other to the yangtze Kiang Valley of China. The term alligator has, however, become a colloquialism for all the crocodilians, and it is also applied in some countries to various lizards that spend most of their time in fresh water. Popular names are also very dangerous in that they become displaced in the most outrageous manner, such as the designation of a species of tortoise in Florida as a gopher, when that is the name for a group of small mammals otherwise called ground squirrels. Reptiles are, however, cold-blooded, and the existence of an aquatic one in even southern British Columbia would be unlikely, to say the least. Yet there is a species of salamander, an amphibian named Batrachochiceps, found in Alaska. And the giant salamander of the mountain streams of Japan is customarily iced in every winter. The mere mention of such a creature as an alligator in this story tends to cast doubt upon its other features. But then, who is to say what can and cannot be? There is volcanicity in the area, and there might thus be hot or warm springs and lakes there. Also, at some time, one or the other of the present-day species of alligator must have gotten over from either China to the Mississippi or vice versa. The only route for such an emigration is over the Bering Straits, thus passing through what is now British Columbia along the way. This matter of volcanicity and hot springs brings us to another really quite fabulous item of Canadian ABS Emery. This is the matter of the lower Nahani area of the Northwest Territories. If you go up to the western part of the Northwest Territories, you will sooner or later be told about the place where banana trees have been grown. Now, this sounds quite wacky, but... If you pursue the matter diligently, you will learn that in the area of the junction of Liard and South Nahani Rivers, see Map 1, lying against the vast mountain barrier which cuts our entire continent from the mouth of the Mackenzie River on the Arctic Sea to Veracruz on the Gulf of Mexico, abutting on to the central plains like a monstrous wall, there is a volcanic area where hot springs are found. There have been mission stations along the Liard for over a century, and it is quite true that at these magnificent vegetables are grown out in the open in the brief but intense summer. Also, they have been raised indoors, and among these vegetables have been a number of banana trees. However, this area, which lies at the south end of the vast Mackenzie Range, has long been one of myth and fantasy. The reports emanating from there cannot better be summed up than by quoting a column from a publication named Doubt, the periodical of the Fortean Society of New York. It was founded by the late author Tiffany Thayer, in conjunction with several other notable persons such as Ben Hecht, in memory of and to carry on the work of Charles Fort, that assiduous collector of borderline reports for so many years. This reads, in part, when speaking of an expedition said to have been organized to visit the area, This valley, number one legend of the Northlands, 
has as its background stories of tropical growth, hot springs, head-hunting mountain men, caves, prehistoric monsters, wailing winds, and lost gold mines. Actual fact certifies the hot springs, the wailing winds, and some person or persons who delight in lopping off prospectors' heads. As for the prehistoric monsters, Indians have returned from the Nahani country with fairly accurate drawings of mastodons burned on rawhide. The more recent history began some 40 years ago, circa 1910, when the two McLeod brothers of Fort Simpson were found dead in the valley and reportedly decapitated. Already the Indians shunned the place because of its mammoth grizzlies and evil spirits wailing in the canyons. Canadian police records show that Joe Mulholland of Minnesota, Bill Espler of Winnipeg, Phil Powers, and the McLeod brothers of Fort Simpson, Martin Jorgensen, Yukon Fisher, Annie Lafert, one O'Brien, Edwin Hall, Andy Hayes, an unidentified prospector, and Ernest Savard have perished in the strange valley since 1910. In 1945, the body of Savard was found in his sleeping bag, head nearly severed from his shoulders. Savard had previously brought rich ore samples out of the Nahani. In 1946, prospector John Patterson disappeared in the valley. His partner, Frank Henderson, was to have met him there, but never found him. The head-hunting mountain men are alleged locally and for a great distance around stretching to the limits of the mountain forest toward Alaska, east to northern Manitoba, and south all the way to the lower Fraser and beyond, to be ABSMs of the Sasquatch type and, with all its characteristics, such as winter withdrawal, occasional bursts of carnivorousness, and so forth. I also have reports in the form of private letters of similar creatures from all across the Northwest Territories, just south of the tree line, and again in northern Quebec province. This is somewhat irksome matter, as I have been unable to obtain any casts of footprints or other physical evidence from these regions, nor even sworn statements as yet. The reports are categoric and specific, those from northern Manitoba are second-hand only, and from Amerindian informants via white men who have hunted there for many years in succession. Those from Quebec have puzzled me for years. I have constantly heard about them, but have only three pieces of paper to show for my exhaustive and prolonged inquiries and appeals. These are all letters from American summer visitors on serious hunting and camping trips by canoe, guided by professional Amerindian trappers and hunters. All three are substantially identical, and all give somewhat similar accounts of events in widely separated places. One is from a lone man, a business executive from Chicago. One is from a party of four men of assorted professions who have hunted for years on their annual vacations together, the third is from the father of a family of four, three grown sons and a then teenage daughter. In each case, a tall, very heavily built, man-shaped creature with bullet head and bull neck and clothed all over with long, shiny black hair with very long arms, short legs, and big hands is said suddenly to have appeared on the bank of a river in which the party was quietly fishing. On one occasion... The creature is said to have carried off some fish left on a rock on the bank. On another, it chased the Amerindian guide out of the woods and into his canoe, and then waded some distance out into the water after him. The family party seemed to have become fairly familiar with two of the creatures over a period of several days. They say they constantly prowled around their camp and showed themselves among the trees whenever they went out in the canoes. One seems to have shown signs of chasing the girl on one occasion, but the father told me they gained the impression that this seemed to be more through curiosity than menace. Two of the Amarins are said to have asserted that they and their people knew the creatures quite well, and that there were quite a lot of them in those forests. The other guide, who was chased, 
appeared to be scared almost witless, and swore that the thing was some form of spirit or devil. However, it smashed branches and hurled stones, it is reported. I am frankly stymied over these reports. Two of the writers asked that I withhold their names in perpetuo, as they did not want reports to become known to their business associates. The third man I never traced. It was many months before I could get to the places from where the people wrote, and although I traced two of them, they all stopped answering my letters, and I left with nothing to follow up. This is an almost chronic condition of laborers in the vineyards of ABS Emory. People almost all just dry up in time. Of course, many probably write in the first place, by way of a joke or just to see how gullible the inquirer is. But not all are of this ilk. Many people also, I believe, take fright in the possibility of ridicule or even become alarmed about their own sanity after they have once gotten something so unusual off their chests. Others, again, either consider the matter explained or just don't want it explained. It takes years of work to get at the facts, and this is rendered almost futile when one is dealing with a new locale that is only just being penetrated by civilized people. The ABSM tradition extends all across Canada, but it is concentrated in southern British Columbia, probably because that was the first area opened up and is still being probed from all around. This is the end of the reading of Chapter 2. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>